Greetings, and welcome to the Helen of Troy Limited first quarter fiscal 2025 earnings call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. A question and answer session will follow the formal presentation. If anyone should require operator assistance during the conference, please press star zero on your telephone keypad. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded. I would now like to turn the conference over to your host, Ms. Sabrina McKee, Senior Vice President of Investor Relations and Business Development for Helen of Troy Limited. Thank you. You may begin. Thank you, Operator. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Helen of Troy's first quarter fiscal 2025 earnings call. The agenda for the call this morning is as follows. I will begin with a brief discussion of forward-looking statements. Ms. Noelle Geoffroy, the company's CEO, will comment on business performance and then provide some perspective on current trends and our strategy for the remainder of the fiscal year. Then, Mr. Brian Grass, the company's CFO, will review the financials in more detail and discuss our revised outlook. Following this, we will open up the call for Q&A. This conference call may contain certain forward-looking statements that are based on management's current expectation with respect to future events or financial performance. Generally, the words anticipates, believes, expects, and other similar words are words identifying forward-looking statements. Forward-looking statements are subject to a number of risks and uncertainties that could cause anticipated results to differ materially from the actual results. This conference call may also include information that may be considered non-GAAP financial information. These non-GAAP measures are not an alternative to GAAP financial information and may be calculated differently than the non-GAAP financial information disclosed by other parties. The company cautions listeners not to place undue reliance on forward-looking statements or non-GAAP information. Before I turn the call over to Ms. Geoffroy, I would like to inform all interested parties that a copy of today's earnings release and related investment deck has been posted to the company's website at www.helenoftroy.com and can be found by navigating to the Investor Relations section of the site or by scrolling to the bottom of the homepage. The earnings release contains tables that reconcile non-GAAP financial measures to their corresponding GAAP-based measures. I will now turn the conference call over to Ms. Geoffroy. Thank you, Sabrina. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. The results we reported this morning are disappointing and not reflective of the measurable progress we've made on key initiatives or of the opportunities I believe we have ahead of us. Net sales and adjusted diluted EPS came in below our expectations, with current trends setting up a challenging backdrop for the remainder of the fiscal year. As a result, we see fiscal 25 as a time to reset and revitalize our business. We continue to believe that our strategies are the right ones to deliver sustainable and profitable growth. However, the additional work and time needed to reset and revitalize means delaying our delivery of the long-term financial algorithm we aspire to. The first quarter has revealed realities about the business and our company that have been a call to action for me, our global leadership team, and the entire organization. While we have made important progress against Project Pegasus and our strategic initiatives, macro factors have worsened since we last spoke, and we have more data and insight on the health of our brands and the business. These factors have put heightened focus on the work we must do in some key areas. I will walk you through the insights we've gained the actions we are taking in response, and evidence of the progress we are making, all of which give me confidence we are making the right choices for the long-term health of our brands and sustained shareholder value creation. First, let me level set with what has and has not changed. I will start with what has not changed. Our commitment to our purpose, vision, and values has never been stronger, and our goal of fostering a winning culture anchored in the four A's of accountability, agility, taking action, and accelerating growth remains steadfast. We are committed to the strategic choices we spoke to you about last October, growing our portfolio through consumer obsession, being and winning where our shoppers shop, fully leveraging our scale and assets, and embracing next-level data and analytics in everything we do. As a house of brands, we are proud of the diversity of our portfolio and the strong consumer following that our brands have across the home, outdoor, beauty, and wellness categories. Our imperative is to revitalize our brands with stronger marketing, innovation, and execution. 
We are investing in the capabilities we need to successfully deliver our strategy over the plan period and well beyond. We are committed to investing in next level data analytics and capabilities to improve our effectiveness and productivity across the enterprise. Lastly, we continue to work smarter. Project Pegasus has been instrumental in further solidifying our transformation from a holding company into a true global operating company, enabling us to work more efficiently and effectively across the organization. Our organization has embraced the changes and continues to learn new processes and new ways of collaborating. The savings generated from the changes are being reinvested back into our brands, which we expect to refuel the value creation flywheel. Now let's discuss what has changed or been exacerbated in the first quarter. As has been widely reported, the macro environment and the health of consumers and retailers has worsened. Consumers are even more financially stretched and are even further prioritizing essentials over discretionary items. Specific to our business, we have seen some areas become more challenged over the last three months. For example, an unexpected slowdown in the global outdoor category impacted sales of our packs and accessories. There was also more pressure in the specialty beauty channel and mass beauty overall, especially in beauty tools under $100. Also, more discretionary household items like dry food storage continue to trend down. We've heard broadly from mass retail that traffic overall is slower throughout the country and promotional pressure is increasing. In reaction to these dynamics, retailers are managing inventories more closely to account for the slowdown, and some are implementing new systems to allow for just-in-time inventory management. All of this exposes us to more volatility and less visibility into order volumes and timing. We are also recognizing the impact that the COVID pandemic had on our business. The industry has had to deal with massive changes in consumption patterns and consumer behavior. There were supply chain issues, overstocking, inventory clearouts, and an explosion in e-commerce. All of this has led to general uncertainty around what a post-COVID environment looks like for many consumer categories, including many of ours, from wellness to kitchen tools to home organization. Also since 2020, categories such as insulated beverage, prestige beauty tools and liquids, air purification, and travel have become increasingly competitive. As we settled into a more normalized world, we have realized that while consumers were still responding positively to our brands, the COVID volatility had masked some underlying weakness in our brand health. My assessment is that we previously underinvested in our brand building fundamentals and marketing. This is why one of my first actions as COO was to initiate Project Pegasus to create fuel and focus to revitalize our brands. We are taking actions to address this underinvestment by prioritizing strong brand building fundamentals and continuing to increase our marketing and innovation spend. However, it has become clear that the path to sustainable brand growth will take longer than we originally anticipated. I spoke earlier about the need to invest in our infrastructure and core capabilities to support the growth we are targeting. Our new distribution center in Tennessee is one of these necessary investments. While this facility brings us next level technology and capacity that will serve us for years to come, we've encountered some near-term disruption as we go live with the last phase of automation. Some implementation hiccups are always expected, but the final phase of startup, which utilizes the highest level of technology and automation, has created some unexpected challenges affecting our fulfillment of small retail customer and direct-to-consumer orders for OXO and Hydroflask. These challenges have impacted us in three ways, lost revenue, delayed productivity savings, and additional costs. The resulting shipping backlog was a factor that drove our net sales miss in the quarter, while the delayed savings and incremental costs to manually work around the system issues and address root causes hurt our profitability. Although these sorts of growing pains are disappointing, upgrading our processes and systems to state-of-the-art capabilities is critical and continues to be the right strategic choice. Our team in Tennessee is working diligently with our suppliers to address the remaining issues, and we have seen our shipping throughput progressively improved during June and early July. I would like to turn now to the actions we are taking to address these issues and maximize our opportunities. Everything starts with our brands, so let's begin there. Beginning in fiscal 24, 
we refocused on the health of our brands and invested in elevating our brand building fundamentals by developing and implementing a Helen of Troy brand building framework across our entire marketing organization. This entailed a rigorous approach to quantitatively define and segment the market, selecting who we are serving and clarifying what our brands stand for. All our marketing content, activation, and innovation will be grounded in these revitalized, data-centric brand strategies. It takes time to do this rigorous upfront work and then activate to rebuild brand relevance and the innovation pipeline needed to gain momentum and drive consistent revenue and share growth. We are encouraged that eight of our key categories are growing share this fiscal year through May, and five others showed share trend improvement in May and our U.S. measured channels. However, we know we are still in the early stages and there is more work to be done. Let me share a couple of examples of our progress. Hydroflask has embraced the shift in the category with new on-trend content that depicts young people in a range of activities extending beyond our traditional positioning. We have launched new designs that appeal to more consumers, such as the popular Sugar Crush line with a waterfall of pastel colors and the two-tone ombre design that both tap into the fashion sense of our target consumer. We also have the timely limited edition USA water bottles for Americans to use as they cheer on our athletes this summer. In addition, we launched a new loyalty rewards program called House of Hydro that allows consumers to earn points that can be used to purchase products on our website. I encourage you to visit hydroflask.com to see the change in our range and our content. Another example is Oxo's recent launch of silicone reusable bags available in many sizes and colors. These bags solve the consumer's need to keep food fresh at home and on the go in a planet-friendly way. They are differentiated from the competition by a seamless design that easily flips inside out for effortless cleaning. They are also microwave, oven, dishwasher, and freezer safe for maximum versatility. OXO is also standing out with its coffee line, earning wire cutter recognition for its nine cup coffee maker and cold brew coffee maker in 2023, and now its conical burr coffee grinder in 2024. I will now shift for a moment and focus on what we are doing at an organizational level to support and build up our brands. The hiring of our first ever global chief marketing officer in mid fiscal 24 and the related investment in our centralized marketing center of excellence or COE has increased our marketing capabilities exponentially. This COE is comprised of 16 subject matter experts bringing critical skills to the company, including business intelligence, category and consumer insights, experience planning and digital strategy, and of critical importance, data and analytics. We now have a clear and consistent view of our category and brand performance, including the underlying drivers and the ROI on our spending by brand and by marketing tactic. This will enable us to more accurately assess the landscape and our brand health and to invest more strategically. To that end, we recently concluded our first ever marketing mix analytics study that provided detailed ROI data. This insight is already helping to inform our portfolio and brand level resource allocations. We will leverage this data to improve our ROI and to enhance our full funnel activation plans to ensure we are connecting with our consumers throughout their product and brand journeys. As it relates to efficiencies, our COE has helped us refine our mix of agency partners to ensure we bring best in class creativity and maximize our working media investment. This refinement not only enhanced our capabilities, but also reduced the number of agencies we work with, resulting in a significant reduction in our non-working spending. I spoke to you last quarter about sales and marketing teams success, identifying and capturing incremental distribution so that our brands are available where our shoppers shop. Recently, we welcomed a new head of our North American regional market organization to provide further leadership to drive the implementation of joint customer business plans and sales capabilities, including our new distribution strategies. I've previously shared that we expanded the OXO Softworks Kitchen Gadget set at Walmart following a successful test. As of June, OXO Softworks Gadgets are in 3,200 doors, and I'm pleased to report that our expansion is performing well, exceeding both our and the customer's expectations. 
Walmart shoppers appreciate the value of OXO's high quality and universal design and kitchen tools with items like our iconic peeler performing in the top 10. Examples of new distribution include Braun and Vic's expansion in key drug and mask customers, Dry Bar Tools and Liquid expansion across various North American retailers, Curl Smith Test in Sephora brick and mortar, and Hydroflask broadening presence in premium grocery customers and beyond. At the brand level, with our consolidation of the beauty business to Central Boston, we have brought in 65 new team members with extensive beauty and consumer products experience. I have been in the beauty and wellness offices several times over the past couple of months, and I can tell you the team is energized and ready to revitalize our brands and pipeline. This team's bold ideas can be seen in our upcoming new dry bar marketing campaign and our product innovation pipeline as evidenced by the recent launch of dry bar liquid glass high gloss smoothing blowout cream, promising consumers up to 72 hours of smooth. This innovation delivers right at the heart of our sharpened brand promise of your best blowout and in line with recent consumer trends for glossy hair, especially when used as a regimen with our dry bar tools. Moving on to the business segment's first quarter market performance, I would like to call out a few bright spots for our brands. In home and outdoor, despite the earlier mentioned softness in the global packs and accessories categories, Osprey continues to gain share in technical packs where it remains the leading brand. Consumers choose Osprey over the competition for its technical prowess in carry, fit, durability, and its use of sustainable materials. The spring introduction of our Escapist on Bike collection was well received and gained immediate traction with bike and outdoor media outlets like Gear Junkie, Bicycle Retailer, and Bike Rumor. Also, recent additions to our extended fit collection generated standout engagement on social media in the quarter. Hydroflask, while performing below our expectations in the U.S., grew in all major international markets. This is the direct result of stronger collaboration between our teams as Hydroflask leverages the experience of the international sales team to open up new opportunities. We expect this expanded distribution internationally, coupled with the previously mentioned distribution gains and new designs in North America, to benefit us in the latter half of this fiscal year. Turning to OXO, the brand retains its number one share in kitchen utensils, and we see signs that the category is stabilizing. We expect our leading market share along with OXO's award-winning product design and innovation to benefit us as we continue to expand distribution in current categories and relevant adjacencies. In beauty and wellness, Drybar expanded its retail presence in Canada, launching in 140 Shoppers Drug Mart locations as well as online in the first quarter. The previously mentioned bold new Drybar campaign launching later this month is a great example of what I mean when I say we are elevating our marketing game. For wellness, year-to-date Pure and our VIX and Braun thermometers have gained market share. Braun and VIX will see an expanded presence in the drug and mass channels beginning in the second quarter, ramping up more in the second half of fiscal 25. And finally, despite the delayed savings related to our Tennessee distribution center, Project Pegasus continues to move forward. We have made good progress on the cost of goods sold work streams, implementing multiple projects that reduce costs, and simplify our supplier base. We have also made good progress on our distribution center optimization by reducing our footprint by four. In closing, when I spoke to you almost three months ago as I was stepping into the CEO role, I could not anticipate I would be sitting here today delivering this message. As I have discussed, the quarter has revealed some realities about our business and our company that we have acknowledged and are addressing. Even with these challenges, I want to reiterate that we remain committed to our strategic choices to deliver sustainable and profitable growth long-term. I can assure you the organization has never been more focused and committed to addressing our challenges with speed and agility. We are committed to the actions needed to reset and revitalize our brands, embrace next-level data and analytics, be and win where the shopper shops, and fully leverage our new distribution network capability. Our success will be driven by the passion and dedication of our exceptional people who remain committed to our purpose, vision, and values. We can and we will do better. Now I will turn it over to Brian. Thank you, Noelle. Good morning, everyone. I'll start by echoing Noelle's comments regarding the disappointment in our first quarter performance and the revision to our full year outlook. 
New headwinds emerged in the first quarter and some existing headwinds became more pronounced since we spoke to you last. These include a combination of executional challenges, a global outdoor slowdown, increased promotional activity, softer and more variable retail replenishment, and greater macro pressure and uncertainty. Many of these became more pronounced towards the end of the first quarter, and some continue to evolve. Our first quarter adjusted EPS results include an adverse impact of approximately 50 cents from unexpected factors that we believe will be largely transitory by the end of the second quarter. This includes the shipping disruption and additional costs from the automation startup issues in our Tennessee distribution facility, lost revenue from the Curl Smith ERP system integration challenges, and an unexpected spike in health insurance and product liability costs. We also faced higher tax expense from Barbados, Barbados tax reform, which became immediately effective in the first quarter. We believe we are now past the Curl Smith ERP integration challenges, and we expect to largely overcome the automation startup issues in our distribution facility by the end of the second quarter. It's important to note that the automation startup issues are only impacting a limited subset of OXO and Hydroflask orders that rely on the highest level of automation but unfortunately, the impact is enough to have a meaningful effect on our results for the first half of fiscal 25. In response to this backdrop, we are adjusting our cost structure in a thoughtful way that preserves our planned growth investment for the year. We are taking actions to realize between 30 and $40 million of additional pre-tax profit improvement in fiscal 25 to partially offset the impact of expected revenue decrease lower operating leverage, the more promotional environment we now see for the remainder of the year, and our outlook for a less favorable sales mix than we expected as we entered the year. I'll now move on to a more detailed discussion of our first quarter results. Consolidated net sales declined 12.2%, driven by a decline in sales of hair appliances, prestige hair care products, and humidifiers in beauty and wellness and a decline in home and outdoor driven by lower replenishment orders from retail customers and a global slowdown in outdoor. Last quarter, we called out pockets of higher inventory in outdoor channels, which has led to a broader and more pronounced category slowdown this quarter. System executional challenges accounted for approximately $8 million of the consolidated net sales decline between the automation startup issues and our Tennessee distribution facility in the integration of Curl Smith into our ERP system. These factors were partially offset by international growth and higher sales of fans in beauty and wellness. We were able to expand gross profit margin by 330 basis points to 48.7% compared to 45.4% the same period last year. The year over year improvement was driven by a favorable segment mix with a higher percentage of home and outdoor sales lower commodity and product costs driven by Pegasus initiatives, and favorable inventory obsolescence expense year over year. These factors were partially offset by a less favorable product mix within the segments, a less favorable customer, customer mix within home and outdoor, and a higher sales, and higher sales dilution from trade discount and promotional allowance programs in beauty and wellness. Gap operating margin for the quarter was 7.4% compared to 8.6% the same period last year. On an adjusted basis, operating margin decreased 360 basis points to 10.3%. The decrease was primarily driven by planned incremental marketing expense of 290 basis points and a 120 basis point estimated impact from additional costs associated with the automation startup issues I referred to earlier. The margin decrease also included higher sales dilution from trade discount promotional allowance programs, increased depreciation, unfavorable health insurance and product liability expense, a less favorable mix within the segments, and lower operating leverage. These factors were partially offset by a favorable overall segment mix with a higher percentage of home and outdoor sales, lower commodity and product costs driven by Pegasus initiatives, and favorable inventory obsolescence expense year over year. 
On a segment basis, home and outdoor adjusted operating margin decreased 520 basis points to 10.6%, driven by planned incremental marketing expense, the additional costs at our Tennessee distribution center, higher depreciation, lower operating leverage, and a less favorable mix. These factors were partially offset by lower commodity and product costs. Adjusted operating margin for beauty and wellness decreased 240 basis points to 10%, driven by planned incremental marketing expense, a less favorable product mix, higher sales dilution from trade discount and promotional allowance programs, and lower operating leverage. These factors were partially offset by lower commodity and product costs and favorable inventory obsolescence expense year over year. Our tax rate in the first quarter was 66.1% compared to 15.5% last year. The year over year increase is primarily due to Barbados tax legislation enacted during the first quarter of fiscal 25, which resulted in a discrete tax charge of $6 million to revalue deferred tax liabilities as well as an increase in our ongoing income tax expense due to the change in tax rate. While we were aware of the longer term potential of Barbados enacting a tax change, we did not expect legislation to be enacted with immediate effect as tax, as tax legislation is rarely introduced in this manner. In response to the global minimum tax changes, we have been developing and implementing various phases of our overall tax planning strategy we expect that the Barbados tax change will not have a meaningful impact on us beyond fiscal 25. Net income was 6.2 million or 26 cents per diluted share. Non-GAAP adjusted diluted EPS was 99 cents per share, reflecting lower adjusted operating income and an increase in the adjusted effective income tax rate, partially offset by a decrease in interest expense. We continue to generate solid cash flow with cash from operations of 25.3 million and free cash flow of 16.2 million. The year over year decline in cash flow is largely due to some strategic inventory build to take advantage of opportunities we see in our peak selling season. We ended the quarter with total debt of 748 million, a sequential increase of 83 million compared to the fourth quarter of fiscal 24 due to the repurchase of $100 million of our stock in the quarter. Our net leverage ratio was 2.37 times compared to two times at the end of fiscal 24. Now, I would like to discuss our revised outlook for fiscal 25. We have taken a hard look at the internal challenges that impacted our business in the first quarter, as well as the more pronounced external trends to reestablish what we believe are obtainable objectives. We expect to resolve the remainder of the automation issues at our Tennessee distribution center by the end of the second quarter, leading to better volume throughput, lower costs, and greater operating efficiency. Our outlook now reflects the expected impact of our executional challenges, as well as our view of increased macro uncertainty, an increasingly stretched consumer, a more promotional environment, and retailers even more closely managing their inventories. We now expect net sales between 1.885 billion and 1.935 billion in fiscal 25, which implies a decline of 6% to 3.5%. This includes a full year estimated impact to net sales of approximately $13 million due to shipping disruption from the automation startup issues at our Tennessee distribution facility and the Curl Smith ERP integration challenges. In terms of our net sales outlook by segment, we now expect a home and outdoor decline of 3% to 1% and a beauty and wellness decline of 8% to 5%, which in continues to include a year over year headwind of approximately 1% related to the expiration of an out license relationship with respect to one of our wellness brands. We now expect gap diluted EPS of $4.69 to $5.45 for the full year and non-GAAP adjusted diluted EPS in the range of $7 to $7.50, which implies an adjusted diluted EPS decline of 21.4% to 15.8%.
We now expect full year adjusted EBITDA margin to compress by approximately 150 to 160 basis points year over year, with approximately 60 basis points coming from the automation startup issues at our Tennessee distribution facility. We continue to expect benefits from Pegasus and other gross profit improvements to be reinvested for growth. While external factors have become more challenging than originally expected, we remain focused on the long-term health of our business and our brands and continue to plan for a year-over-year increase in growth investment spending of roughly 100 basis points. Our adjusted EBITDA outlook continues to include a year-over-year headwind of approximately 50 basis points from the expiration of the out-license relationship referred to earlier. We now expect some gross margin compression from our view of a more promotional environment and a less favorable sales mix. However, we still expect to expand gross margin year over year due to Project Pegasus. Finally, we anticipate lower operating leverage from the decline in revenue, which we expect to be more than offset by the additional profit improvement actions I referred to earlier. In terms of Project Pegasus, We are maintaining the cost savings, cadence, and restructuring cost estimates that we discussed in our April call and which are outlined in our earnings release. We now expect a gap effective tax rate range of 27.3% to 29.5% for the full fiscal year and a non-gap adjusted tax rate range of 20.7% to 21.3%. We expect capital and intangible asset expenditures of between 30 and 35 million for fiscal 25, which includes remaining equipment and technology of approximately $9 million associated with our Tennessee distribution facility. We now expect free cash flow in the range of 220 to 240 million, which implies a free cash flow yield of 10.8% to 11.8% using Friday's closing share price and adjusted EBITDA in the range of 287 to 297 million. Net leverage ratio as defined in our credit agreement is now expected to be between 1.6 times and 1.5 times by the end of fiscal 25. In terms of the quarterly cadence of sales, we now expect a decline of 7% to 4% in the second quarter of fiscal 25 and a decline of 2.5% to growth of 1% in the second half of the year. We expect a decline in adjusted diluted EPS of 45% to 35% in the second quarter, and a decline of 3% to growth of 3% in the second half of the year. Finally, our outlook does not include an estimated impact of a potential divestiture. We have continued to advance in our process but have extended our timeline as there have been new entrants and we are prioritizing value over speed. We have a small team that is largely dedicated to the effort, so we believe the risk of distraction is minimal. We believe M&A requires discipline, and if our value expectations are not met, we will not transact. We have improved the business significantly over the last couple of years, and its dilutive impact to our growth rate and margin has been minimized. While we are disappointed with the start of fiscal 25 and its implications for the full year, we intend to use it as an opportunity to reset and revitalize our business. As Noel mentioned, we see underlying improvement in many aspects of our business, but it is clear that it will take longer than originally expected to produce long-term growth algorithm in our strategic plan. However, I continue to see proof points that we are on the right path. We now have a much stronger brand building capability and culture within the company We've generated savings to fuel a step-level increase in brand and innovation investment. We are better leveraging data to invest that spend more efficiently and strategically, and we are investing in state-of-the-art infrastructure that is critical for our future success. I'm more convinced than ever that these foundational improvements are positioning us to deliver reliable long-term growth and sustain shareholder value creation. And with that, I'll turn it back to the operator. Thank you. At this time, we'll be conducting a question and answer session. If you'd like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. A confirmation tone will indicate your line is in the question queue. You may press star 2 if you'd like to remove your question from the queue. For participants using speaker equipment, it may be necessary to pick up your handset before pressing the star keys. 
In the interest of time, we ask that you each keep to one question and one follow-up and invite you to requeue for additional questions. Thank you. Our first question comes from the line of Rupesh Parikh with Oppenheimer & Company. Please proceed with your question. Good morning, and thanks for taking my question. So I just wanted to go back to your quarterly cadence back half of your commentary. So I just want to get a sense, you know, what, what's driving that confidence in being able to drive the top and bottom line improvement in the back half of the year? Uh, it just appears, you know, some of the challenges on the macro consumer front and competitive side could continue to the back half of the year. So maybe some more granularity in terms of the top line drivers that drive that improvement. Also, some, some, some of the key drivers of the bottom line improvement. Thank you. Hey, Rupesh, it's Brian. I can start, and Noel may want to build. I'd say our outlook reflects what we believe is a conservative view of point-of-sale trends. And, and what we did is really assume that those remain constant for the remainder of the year. Um, our most recent trends are better than what we assumed, and share has improved across many categories through May, as Noel has discussed. Um, we also reflected visibility that we have into um, promotions, uh, order replenishment with our retailers, and, and any other factors we have visibility to do with our, with our retailers into our outlook. Um, as mentioned, we assume that Kroll Smith uh, integration issues are, are now behind us and that shipping disruption in our Tennessee distribution facility would continue through Q2. And then any incremental kind of revenue layered on that base is really from tangible building blocks that we have clear line of sight to. So that would be new innovation, and, and we take a conservative view on new innovation because, you know, it's, it's a new product and, and, you know, sometimes those take time to, to get traction. So we look at that conservatively. New distribution that we have line of sight to, and then marketing investment that we're making and, and retained in our outlook um, and, and the return uh, that we assume on that is based uh, on data and analytics that, that we feel comfortable with. So that's kind of the top line um, uh, view. And then with respect to uh, margin, you know, we, we, tr we, we have a, a bridge in our, um, in our investor deck that you may have seen. That, that will talk about kind of the puts and takes that we did assume with respect to um, margin. And, you know, we did take into account more promotional uh, environment that we're, we're recently seeing. We're also seeing, you know, a less favorable mix than, than what we expected as we were going into the year. So we factored that in and assumed it for the remainder of the year. Um, it continues to reflect the impact of the out license uh, expiration. And then importantly, we intentionally made our cost structure decisions in a way that preserves the growth investment um, target that we had going into the year. So our intent is to continue to invest in, the, in brand health for the long term, and so we retained our growth investment um, for the remainder of the year as a percentage of sales. And then we factored in what we think is a very conservative view of the incremental iron giant costs. Uh, in, with respect to margin. Um, Pegasus, no change, as you probably saw in the earnings release, and so we, we think we'll continue to get those benefits. And then, importantly, we, we adjusted our cost structure and identified cost improvement uh, or profit improvement actions of 20 to $30 million that we're using to uh, offset operating leverage, offset the, the incremental iron giant costs, and... and um, you know, allow us to preserve the growth investment spending. So th those are the puts and takes in both revenue and um, uh, earnings or, or margin. And I believe we've, we've tried very hard to have a conservative view on all aspects. Great. Yeah, the only thing I would yeah. make, Rupesh, is, is just, you know, that we, again, as Brian outlined, and, you know, and, and all the different different pieces and parts, we really tried to, to work here as we got all of this information data in in the first quarter to reestablish what we believe are obtainable objectives for, for the remainder of the year across both the top and, and bottom line. And then my quick follow-up question, uh, is there any granularity in terms of updated gross margin expect, expectations? I know last time I think you guys expected or implied a, a little over 100 basis points. So I don't know if there's anything more granular that you can provide. Yeah, what I said in my prepared remarks, and, I, and I'm trying to stay away from 
you know, giving you any uh, specific targets other than adjusted EBITDA margin and adjusted operating income. But what I said in my prepared remarks is we do expect some compression from the, the more promotional environment and the, you know, slightly uh, less favorable mix, but we still expect to expand gross profit margin for the full year. Okay, great. Thank you. I'll pass it along. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Linda Bolton-Weiser with DA Davidson. Please proceed with your question. Yes, hi. Um, so I, I sort of get the feeling that there's a little bit of, of a peeling back of the onion in terms of discovering, I guess, maybe things that were not as expected um, within the company. So I guess I'm wondering, like, do you feel that there's been some holding back of information by some of the operating people in the company? Do, do you feel like you need maybe a, to, to bring in a chief operating officer to help manage all these moving pieces? Um, I, I just, like, I'm, afra I'm afraid that there's more shoes to drop, you know, in terms of real, realizing that there's some other issues because we've seen a couple quarters now where things have emerged. So maybe you could just kind of explain, like, kind of internally what's going on communication-wise across the divisions and and how, 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 Noelle, I guess how you feel about what's going on. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Linda, and I, I, I appreciate the, the spirit of the question. And I would say, you know, the, the biggest thing I would say in, in this quarter is, is a real emphasis on data and analytics as the basis for our strategy and a basis for our decision making. And, and that is new. It's, it's more of a new muscle for the company. Um, I talked about my prepared remarks bringing in a, a lot of new subject matter experts uh, from a marketing COE standpoint and data and analytics, business intelligence, rigor behind our brand building frameworks, et cetera. Were, were all a part of that. And I would say during the quarter, several of those data points came together that allowed me to really get further under the hood on our brand health. Um, and that was a combination of the, you know, the quantitative data associated with the brand building framework, but also importantly, we got the marketing mix model regression data in um, this quarter. And, and it, it's a powerful wake up call, I think, not, not only for, for me to get that, that data and insight, but also for the full organization. You know, we had an organization of, of folks, um, and, and you've, you know, covered the company for a long time, who enjoyed strong growth during the pandemic. Um, and so their mindset was in one of brand health. And I think as we've gotten some of this data in, we've recognized there are some, some things that the pandemic masked, some brand health, underlying brand health issues that, that, it, that it masked, and also some of the underinvestment um, that, that we had, you know, have had previously on, on the business. So I think the new data and that data-based approach to things and the insights that that brings um, is allowing us to bring more clarity across the organization of where we are what, what, and acknowledge what we need to work on and now focus on the actions that we need to take and the momentum moving forward across the organization. I would say as I look specifically at the marketing mix data, a few things, you know, a, a few things come out of that for me. One is I'm actually generally very encouraged to see um, positive ROI on media investment across most of our brands and most of our tactics. So that tells me we have room to op optimize further and we've, we've built that into our year to go as, as Brian outlined. Um, we also see there's further room to invest that so we have not reach saturation, which is why we worked so hard in our year to go to preserve um, the, the incremental growth investment that we had built into the P&L, because that's going to be really key for us. But it also showed us some underlying brand health weakness that's, that's slowing our progress and not allowing us to make as much headway as quickly as, as we, we might have anticipated before. We do have a lot of positive building blocks that we've talked about in the past. We've got the incremental distribution. We've gained some. There's some um, a slide in, in the investor deck that you can see online that, that shows tangibly what we've gained, and we've got more to come in the, in the back half of the year. But we've also got some other areas of weakness that, that we've got to address in order to get the, the, the full portfolio turned back to a, to a growth posture. Um, so that, that's what I would say in terms of kind of the brands and the brand health. I think some of the other areas that, that came up, you, you know, the, probably the biggest one is the Tennessee Distribution Center. And, you know, this was 
as we've talked about for quite some time, a, a very um, significant state-of-the-art new distribution facility, most of which is operating very, very well um, and started operating you know, back in fiscal 24, this last piece of phase up is where the most complex part of automation has come in. And that's where um, kind of mid-May we reached, um, we uncovered some, some challenges with the systems and the automation there. The team's working really diligently and powering through now shipping the business, but we still have some root cause work on some of the systems to get that last piece of, of the distribution center operating. That's a, that's a little bit of a perspective of where, where my head is. Okay, and then um, my second question is, um, just to have a better understanding, like maybe a breakdown somehow more of the 12% sales decline in the quarter, because you said the execution issues were only 8 million, that's only about 2% decline. Your POS and track channels is, is actually running flattish against easy prior year comparisons. So in track channels, that should be worse than your non-track channels. So your POS is, I, I don't know, do you have a sense for what your all-channel POS is in the quarter or what it was? I mean, was it up? Was it down? You know, but even if it was down 5% or, you know, it just seems like your 12% sales decline is far exceeding what your POS is. So is the rest of all that just the inventory reductions at retail? Is that the, the, the plug that is the difference between your POS and, and your sales performance? Thanks. Yeah, so, I mean, as we look at our Q1 revenue shortfall, there, there were, there's a piece of it that, that's the executional challenges with both Carl Smith and, and TNDC, and that, that's about 1.7 percentage points of, of the decline that we saw in the quarter. The other areas, a, a big one for us was the global outdoor slowdown. That was, we talked last quarter about some pockets of retailer inventory there. It manifested into a slowdown, so an area that had been much stronger has, has slowed down. There's not a lot of that, probably in the measured channels that you're looking at. Outdoor tends to be outside of, I think, what, what you track, um, and that, that was a big change for us uh, in the quarter. Um, I, I would say we did, as, as we called out, see softer and more variable retail retailer replenishment. Um, so that impacted kind of the sales for the quarter that you're not going to see in the POS um, from, a, from an ordering pattern standpoint. Um, those are probably the biggest drivers, Brian. Well, and promotional activity too, which is a reduction to sales. It's, it's a sales dilution. So that's something that also you wouldn't see in the POS data that you're looking at. And, and we, we try and have a very complete view. We, we can't get data on all channels and all categories, but, but to your question about do, do we have a complete view, we, we attempt very hard and buy a lot of data to get the most complete view possible. Yeah, we've, we've increased our view, I would say, from a data and analytics standpoint of, of our view across point of sale and across our categories. I will say, you know, as we've looked at June, we've seen some more favorable trends than what we saw in May. And as Brian mentioned, our assumption was, you know, we would stay where we were for the remainder of the year on, on where we were in May. June was, was a bit more positive than, than what we were seeing through May. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Bob Labick with CGS Securities. Please proceed with your question. Good morning. I just want to kind of follow up on the last uh, point you made there. And the, the, the question I can't articulate or answer yet is kind of what happened to the visibility? Um, you, know, you gave initial guidance in kind of late April, so two thirds of the way through the quarter, but then Q1 was obviously more difficult than expected, even with that. And this hasn't really been typical uh, for Helen of Troy. So uh, I guess what's impacting or what impacted your visibility and what can be done to change and restore it? Or was it just faster macro and the kind of prior visibility that we thought was more an illusion? How should we think about your, you know, your visibility and what impacted, you know, specifically this quarter's, you know, last quarter's guidance to now? Yeah, I would say, you know, there are some things that got worse 
some things that you know back when, when we talked to you in April we knew but got worse. That would be things like the, you know some of the macro areas, the weakening consumer, higher promotional activity, some of the retailer replenishment um, got worse as the as the quarter went on. The global outdoor slowdown that I just mentioned that that was you know more pronounced as as the quarter went on. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the marketing mix model data was something that we got in the quarter that that gave us kind of. A, Linda used a phrase, peeling back the onion. It allowed us to peel back the onion a bit more and really understand what was going on on, on some of our, our base businesses. What we didn't know at all, um, Bob, when we talked to you in April, were, were some of the TNDC issues, the, the distribution center issues. Those arose in mid-May, um, so they were quite late in the quarter um, that those came to, to fruition. And then on the bottom line side, a couple of things that, that came uh, at the end of the quarter was the unexpected rise or spike in our health insurance costs, product liability costs, and then the very sudden enact enactment of the, the Barbados tax reform. So those would be the things that um, that I would say we, certain things we had some visibility to, but they were worse than, than what we were anticipating, and then some others that truly were um, very, very late in the quarter developments. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, I'd add a little, Bob. If you just try and walk backwards from the 12.2% decline, you know, the the system challenges get you close to 10. And then from there, to, to look at the range that we had provided, I would say that for me, the, the biggest surprise was really the acceleration of the, the outdoor slowdown. That was something we were not expecting. Osprey was growing. Osprey was gaining share. By the way, it continues to gain share. The category is down, but it's gaining share uh, as the category declines. And then we, we did see a, a fairly sudden and abrupt adjustment in order patterns with with two uh, key retailers. So, um, you know, those were big adjustments that we were not expecting. And then we, we had not been seeing promotional activity very much up until very recently towards the end of the quarter started to see that amp up fairly significantly. So for me, it's kind of those, you know, three big things that kind of get you from 10, 10% down to, to the outlook with, that we provided. Okay, thanks. And then maybe just help us level set because there's so many moving parts. What is the underlying demand from your categories right now? What do you expect it to be this year and what do you expect it to be over a medium term period? Yeah, you know, I would say as I look across our categories, we have we have a lot and they're they're all in, in various various different stages. I think, you know, we've got some categories um that are performing fairly well, insulated beverage, um, high-end hair tools, uh, uh, prestige liquids and, and hair continue to perform well as a total category. I would say um, kitchen utensils, as I mentioned in my remarks, are stabilizing. Um, you know, I think kind of coming off of the pandemic, that's a category now that's stabilizing. On the flip side, the dry um, uh, food storage is is declining. You know, that's one that I think, you know, really hit a spike during the pandemic. It's been coming down since then and it's actually taken an even more dramatic negative turn more recently as, as consumers are, you know, tightening and, and not spending as much on discretionary items. Um, outdoor had been, as Brian just mentioned, had been performing quite well from a PAC standpoint, a travel standpoint. That's also come down uh, in in the recent, you know, recent quarter somewhat unexpectedly, that has been a really strong performer for us. So that's, you know, that's what I would say overall from a category standpoint. I would say as, as we look at our performance in those categories, as I mentioned in my remarks, you know, May May saw some, some more positive green shoots. We, we grew share in eight of our categories, some of which are healthy categories, some of which are, are you know, maybe less healthy categories. But, you know, grew share, for example, in thermometers on both Braun and, and VIX. Um, grew share and kitchen utensils on, on Oxo, as Brian mentioned, we grew share in uh, tech packs uh, with Osprey despite the decline in that category, as well as some other adjacent categories in, uh, in Osprey as we've extended that brand. We grew share um, in insulated travelers on Hydroflask um, in uh, fiscal year to date through May, so we're starting to see some, some positive momentum there. We would also say some share trend improvements in May in areas like hair appliance, insulated beverage wear in total, um, travel packs, that, those kinds of areas. So, 
you know, there's, there's some kind of puts and takes in various areas, but I would say overall, I was encouraged by some of the positive momentum in our share performance in, in May. We still have a long way to go, a lot of work to do, but I was encouraged by that, the progress. And, and just to clarify, Bob, when Noel refers to May, that's data that we'll get in June or, or later, and that's not what we use to, to um, use for our outlook. So our outlook would have had an earlier view of point of sale trends, demand, category, share. all the share, all those things. And so, you know, to you know, one of the questions I answered earlier, the conservatism, we feel like we've we've taken a conservative point of view of all those trends from an earlier point uh, that we saw kind of in May. But what Noel's referring to is the data okay, through yeah. May that we got after that, which has improved in, in many aspects. Okay, uh, I think I get that. Thanks very much. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Olivia Tong with Raymond James. Please proceed with your question. Great, thanks. Good morning. Um, just following up on share performance, um, you know, as we go into sort of the fall reset period, how should we think about not necessarily um, share move, you know, share moves, but the risk that there is going to be um, less space, you know, less shelf space for the categories that you're in? Yeah, you know, I would say, um, Olivia, we, you know, we continue to, to have a, a strong strategy of, of be and win where the shopper shops. Uh, as, as part of our strategic plan, and that, that has been a focus. We've successfully gained new distribution uh, across many different customers and channels already, and we've got more lined up um, in, in the year-to-go period. So I see us successfully using data and analytics, bringing, you know, bringing good perspective on our brands, and broadening the presence of our brands in, in retailers. So. Um, I think overall that's going to be a positive for for our portfolio and for our brands. You know, there are there are pockets and, and places where we've we've lost some ground in places. Maybe you know we've lost a couple of items that aren't performing as well, or um, shelf you know presence or placement you know might have gone down. And those are some of the factors that come into some of the underlying brand health issues. And part of what we need to really focus on is strengthening the core brands so that we maintain all the facings, all the, you know, the, the eye level placement, all of those things that really help ensure that the, the brand is physically available and, and front and center on the shelf. Got it. Um, and then maybe uh, I want to pivot this discussion a little bit um, to, to a couple of line items, one being um, the hair categories, uh, because you mentioned the greatest pressures on tools under $100. Can you talk about order of magnitude, you know, your, of of sales um, versus your expectations at the low end uh, versus the high end. If you if you saw you know kind of give us an idea of order of magnitude of of, um, of the differences there. Yeah, I would say you know we're for a, a several quarters now that the you know kind of the energy in the category has been at the high end of of hair tools. I would say at the low end <clears throat> there's. You know that the, that's where the pressured consumer is, is kind of not not making purchases of discretionary items like new hair tools, and so we're seeing more pressure there. I will say, you know, we do still have a strong presence there as we look at the filled out shelf stuff that we have in mass retailers, for example, of, of you know what I would call kind of more opening good items basic hair dryers, basic curling irons, basic straighteners, et cetera, were performing well there from a share standpoint, but the category overall at that under $100 is, is more depressed as consumers in that, you know, shopping that range are, are looking to spend their money more on the essentials and less on the discretionary items. The energy in the category is more at the high end. We play <clears throat> not at the very high end, um, that, that the category is traded at, but we do have dry bar in that area, and that's a, an area, quite frankly, I want us to play, you know, stronger in, in the future, and that's, you know, part of the brand building framework work was really to get after who is our target there, what are our points of difference, and how can we play even more successfully at that higher end where the category is, is performing well. I think Regimen is going to be a key to that. We're one of the few brands that offer both liquids and tools. 
Um, I, I talked about hot rollers last time. That's doing well for us. We've launched uh, liquid glass on uh, dry bar that's, that's having a positive impact on our dry bar liquids portfolio when used in combination with some of our dry bar tools, you really get that perfect at-home blowout that, that our consumer is looking for. So those are some of the initiatives and angles that we need to continue to push in order to perform more strongly where the category action is in that higher end. Got it. So fair to assume that you're doing better in hair at Ulta versus Walmart, I assume. I would say that our performance at Walmart at the on the entry level tools is strong. The category overall isn't performing, you know, is is not as, as strong as consumers aren't changing there. But our performance with Revlon tools in particular at Walmart from a share perspective is good. The category is, is less good. Where the category is stronger is in that that higher price price range. Got it. That's very helpful. Um, this last question, two, um, two for me. One on shipping and logistics and just thinking through the potential for higher tariffs. First, on, on shipping and logistics, can you talk about your um, whether that uh, higher shipping costs, you know, uh, Red Sea avoidance, things like that are embedded into the revised outlook? And then on the manufacturing um, exposure, just thinking through the potential that we'll have higher tariffs, what percentage of your products are made in China? and how difficult would it be to diversify your manufacturing footprint if that made um, if, if that was a logical choice should tariffs go higher? Thank you. So Olivia, thanks for the question. On with respect to shipping costs, we are contracted for a very high percentage of our costs, and so we feel good. And and we purposely uh, don't contract 100%, so we can have some level of flexibility to take advantage of of opportunistic pricing, but, you know, somewhere near 80% is contracted into next fiscal year. So we, we feel good about uh, that and the protection that that provides. Um, with respect to tariffs, I, I would say, look, there's no way to perfectly protect um, ourselves. We, we manufacture about 79% of our goods in Asia, and about 15% of that is outside of China. And so that's that. You know, the the difference there is what we would be dealing with with, with respect to a uh, tariff exposure. We are currently working on several significant projects with our suppliers to move production into areas outside of China that are still in the Asia re region. And and right now that that seems like the best strategy to diversify the the supply base and and reduce expo potential exposure to tariffs. We we also have North America sourcing that that you know we were we were taking action there as, as a strategic initiative. That one has proven out to be you know not as successful as I would say the the. Asia areas outside of China, that's that's proving to be a more successful strategy, and that's one that we're leaning into. And, and like I said, we have several projects underway to, to move production there. So hopefully that, that gives you a sense. Very clear. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Peter Grom with UBS. Please proceed with your question. Thanks, operator, and good morning, everyone. So I wanted to take a step back and kind of think about the long-term strategy in the context of what you're learning both internally and externally right now. And, you know, maybe going back to the commentary to, to prior questions, maybe just to start, do you still feel like these, these targets are achievable? And then, Brian, I think you mentioned that it could take longer to achieve these targets. Just any thoughts on, on when they, that may happen? I mean, is this more of a a one-year reset, or do you think kind of these internal, external cha changes um, could make returning to the targets outlined back in October a multi-year process? So, Peter, just to clarify, when you say these targets, I think you're referring to the long-term Elevate for Growth strategic plan targets. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Yes. I mean, look, I think we, at this point in time, that's that's you know, what we're working towards, I think we have to assess, obviously, how the environment progresses for the remainder of this year. We do see this as, as we mentioned, a reset and revitalize uh, year, and we are making investment. We're, you know, over 
Over two years, we will have increased our growth investment by over $40 million. And, and I'll point out that it was very back half weighted in fiscal 24, and it's going to be very, you know, front end weighted in fiscal 25. And so, you know, we, we feel like we are making the right choices for the long term health of the business. And with that level of investment, new distribution, new innovation, we feel like that gives us a lot of tangible building blocks to get on the path towards Elevate for Growth. Um, and, and so, yet we have to see how the rest of the year plays out, how the environment plays out. But I would say at this point in time, that's still very much our vision. I don't know if you want to add anything. No, I, I agree. I mean, you know, I, I would the only thing I would build on is, uh, you know, as I've gotten the marketing that's modeling data and seen fairly positive ROIs across our portfolio, across the tactics with opportunity to optimize, with opportunity to continue to invest smarter and strategically, um, that only bolsters my confidence that that's the right path forward for us. We've, we've got to get our core brands growing consistently, um, and, and the data actually shows that that's, that will work with, with the right continued fueling and the right kind of brand fundamentals in place. Okay, that's really helpful. And then just maybe, you know, two quick follow-ups. Just on the outdoor declines, can you maybe just talk about the channel more broadly? A lot of the commentary seems to be concentrated in packs rather than, you know, weakness across the entire channel. So, But I'm not sure if that's a fair read or not. And then on Hydroflask, you mentioned you were disappointed with North America performance. Um, maybe could you unpack that a bit more? Is that a function of category softness, or are you seeing share losses versus uh, some of the brands in the category? Thanks. Yeah, so I would say on outdoor, um, we're seeing a slowdown overall in outdoor. Our outdoor retailers in general are, are you know, sl have slowed down and they're managing their inventories uh, accordingly. Um, so it's, for us, the main, you know, the major impact is is on our on our pack business um, because that's that's where our you know predominant outdoor is a little bit on hydroflask but as, as we know and i'll pivot to the answer the second question is the insulated beverage wear category has broadened well beyond kind of an outdoor consumer lens to you know a, a much broader consumer base so while it has it is impacted somewhat by outdoor it, it, it's actually much much broader than that now um, and and then i would say on, on hydroflask my disappointment in, in north america is you know it, it has become a a, a big competitive category and you know I think um, hydroflask has now you know really embraced the shift of where this category has gone and I think that's really evident in a lot of the the new designs that we see if you look at our website you look at our content you look at the designs we have out there from the ombre to the sugar crush um, to the you know USA limited edition we just launched a new happy days um, floral limited edition etc these are very very different looking um, designs than you would have seen from Hydroflask, you know, probably even six months ago where everything was more of an earthy tone and, you know, very focused on hiking and, and outdoor activities. Now it's a much broader view of where the category is. Um, and, and we're seeing positive traction from that. As I mentioned, we're, we're now growing share in, um, in the Tumblr se uh, section. And in May, we're starting to see uh, a share trend uptick across the entire insulated beverage category. Um, and, you know, I think we'll continue to see that momentum and we'll continue to see uh, a broadened distribution footprint that's going to that's gonna help us get back on track uh, for this brand. Great. Thanks so much. I'll pass it on. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Susan Anderson with Canaccord Genuity. Please proceed with your question. Hi. Good morning. Thanks for taking my question and all the details today. Um, I guess maybe just to follow up on the consumer softness softness that you saw um, in the quarter, I guess I'm wondering if you're expecting that to improve in the back half based on the guidance, or is it really just those other external factors improving? Um, and then maybe just talk about, you know, kind of what you're expecting for a second quarter for demand as well. Thanks. Thanks, Susan. Um, no, I would say, you know, as Brian outlined earlier, what, what we did when we, we – Put together this outlook as we assumed the point of sale trends that we were seeing kind of through you know call it mid-may timing and that that would you know continue through the rest of the year and those those were you know difficult trends and i would say you know as as we've now got a little bit more data through june we're seeing actually more positive trends 
in June than what we used for for our outlook. So I, I would say we, you know we were not factoring in a measurably improved consumer outlook. Actually, we were assuming that that the POS trends that were challenging in the first quarter continue throughout the, the balance of the year. In the, in the, Susan, the only point I would add is in the second half of the year, we'll start to lap some easier compares. We did not assume any improvement in trend, even though the comparisons will be easier in the second half of the year. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of perspective in terms of our attempt to have a conservative view with respect to this outlook. So we, we've assumed that, you know, the trends that were pretty unfavorable mid-May um, and, and said that those would remain constant for, for the entire year. So no improvement, even though the comparison in the second half of the year will get significantly easier. Okay, got it. Yeah, that's helpful. Um, and then maybe just in beauty, a follow-up there. Uh, you talked about softer consumer demand I, I believe in both tools and liquids now, which that's the first time I think I've heard you guys talk about it in liquids. So, you know, it seemed like last quarter it was still very, the category was strong. And Noelle, I think you mentioned too that, um, you know, hair liquids is still um, a pretty strong industry. So I'm curious, I guess, how much of the softness you're seeing is industry wide versus maybe some other share losses with your brands there. And then just on Curl Smith, I guess, when do you expect those disruptions to be fixed? Thanks. Yeah, when I look at hair liquids, the category um, in prestige liquids is still pretty strong. It's maybe a little less strong than than it once was, but it's you know it's it's still it still has some growth to it. The curl smith issue that you just mentioned at the end did uh, adversely impact us. Um, we had a stronger June um, than than we did uh, a, a first quarter as we put those behind us. We do believe those are are now behind us on on curl smith. Um, dry bar, I would say, from a liquid standpoint, we've had some some wins and some losses um, from a from a retailer standpoint. The new innovation on on liquid glass is is doing well for us. Very very strong ratings on on Ulta.com for the blowout cream that I mentioned, the finishing serum that's that's showing some positive halo on the business. Um, so I think you know starting to see some positive there on, on dry bar, but. Um, probably not as strong overall performance on, on dry bar as I'd like to see us. And I think we're, we'll, some of the new innovation will help us trend in, in a better direction there. Okay, great. Thanks so much. Good luck the rest of you. Thanks, Susan. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we come to the end of our time allowed for questions. I'll now turn the floor back to Ms. Jebois for any final comments. Thank you all for, for joining us today. I know we covered a lot this morning, um, but I hope as you leave the call, we've been able to articulate how committed we are to the choices that we've made and that the entire organization is very focused on achieving the financial objectives that we, we outlined for you today. Thanks very much. Thank you. This concludes today's conference call. You may disconnect your lines at this time. Thank you for your participation.